seven counties. I work in Westchester. Um, I uh, manage the legal program out of our White Plains office. And I like to, and I'm, I'm really somebody who's on the program side, but I like to describe myself at Legal Services as a program person who is really interested in technology. Um, I'm by no means the technology um, expert, but I really enjoy talking about and thinking about technology. And I can see we've got some Legal Services people here. So hi to my Legal Services teammates. All right. Thanks very much, Joanne. Sally, if you'd like to do a brief introduction of yourself as well. Hi, everyone. My name is Sally Curran. I'm the Executive Director of the Volunteer Lawyers Project of Onondaga County in Central New York. Uh, we're based out of Syracuse. We are um, one of the many pro bono focused organizations across the state, and I've been here um, just over eight years now. Uh, and during that time, I've had the good fortune slash the mis occasional misfortune of leading us through many different uh, tech upgrades. And in the case of document management, I've upgraded us twice because um, I didn't like one of our, the way our first one turned out. So I think that many people who are deeply involved in the tech understand and appreciate that, that it's a, it's a journey rather than a destination. And I see a lot of names I recognize here. So hi, everyone. Nice to, uh, nice to be in a room with you all. Thanks very much, Sally. I'll do my introduction. I don't uh, know as many names, uh, so and that'll become evident as to why when I do my intro. So uh, I'm Stephen Goldmeyer. Uh, my uh, background really is in criminal defense. I did uh, approximately six years in uh, criminal appeals in Ohio as a lawyer, uh, representing people in cases all over the state. And then I transitioned to doing technology work, uh, working on case management systems in Ohio, and also in a transition of something like six different offices to an entirely new document management system with different practices in each of those offices. Then I worked at the Bronx Defenders where I did a couple of smaller projects around document management. And now at, Le at um, Just Tech, I'm working on even more document management projects and legal server projects and stuff like that. So um, uh, anything that I say about document management does not come from sort of like insight or smarts. It comes from like hard learned lessons from failing many times before. And I think our, I think our panelists and many other folks just in the audience are going to agree with that. Um, I do see a colleague from the Bronx Defenders. Hi, Runa. Good to see you. Uh, but, uh, but beyond that, I don't, like I said, I don't really know a lot of the names because I'm relatively new to uh, civil legal services. Um, so yeah, thanks very much for those intros. Let me make sure I have our outline together. Uh, we're going to talk briefly now about what we mean by doc management, document management, and sort of what we plan on talking about today. Uh, as I said, this is not the sort of technical aspects of document management. We're much more talking about, you know, if you design, let's say, the perfect technical system for document management, you could still find that nobody knows how to use it, nobody's willing to use it, nobody likes it. Right, and so uh, as I said, lessons learned from having that happen in the past. Um, you know, we'll share some of our thoughts on how to get an office thinking together about how to, uh, you know, really collaborate on document management, turn it into a collaborative practice with shared goals, shared vision, et cetera, and really change culture around how people treat their documents and their file storage uh, at your individual offices. So to start us off on the right foot of thinking about those kinds of questions, we're gonna ask each of the panelists now to share what they consider their sort of number one challenge in their document management projects that they've had so far. And I would invite everybody to put in the chat uh, their own sort of what is your number one challenge around document management, the number one thing that you find challenging about doc management. And we'll use those responses to sort of, you know, uh, include them in our remarks, uh, maybe answer some of those, talk about some of those specifically. But so please do put in the chat any of your thoughts on the number one problem you face when you're thinking about a document management project from like, I don't even know how to get started to like, I don't know how to like choose what metadata I want in my system, <laughs> you know? Uh, so yeah, so Joanne, if you don't, you can get us started again on sure. what you think is, yeah, the number one challenge for you. So many challenges. Um, <laughs> so I think one of the number one challenges we faced with document management is really just all of these systems over time internally kind of evolving on their own and people deciding, for example, to keep all of their client files using their own methods, right? And that doesn't lead to an, an approach that um, 
will enable people to be able to help and support each other, collaborate over documents, or in case something comes up and a supervisor or a colleague has to step in, even to be able to find the documents. Um, and, you know, this was, um, you know, we had a separate process where we honed and curated, um, you know, practice area libraries for a SharePoint project. Um, but we also had to unexpectedly use that project as almost like a lifeboat during our um, pivot from working in the office to working from home. And that was the moment I discovered that everyone really had developed their own system for keeping their client folders. And the system in some cases was very clear to me. In other cases, I didn't even know where to look in the folder to find the person's client files. So that was, you know, a big challenge that we quickly identified became an impediment to migrating documents to SharePoint. And so we quickly uh, made some policies around that. But I think I've heard from other organizations that that can be a big challenge. And Sally, what do you, what is your perspective on sort of what you'd say is the number one big challenge? Because again, there are a lot of challenges. Sure. But yeah. So um, we use SharePoint and Microsoft three the Microsoft three sixty five World for all of our documents and for most most everything we do except for legal server and case management at this point. And we've done that since about twenty fourteen. And before that, we had um, just a shared drive like a local server. And um, when we initially transitioned over, um, you know, we tried to sort of replicate what the the experience was like on a shared drive, which incidentally is not the best way to do document management, let alone in a, a cloud-based way. Um, and, and still, even so, when we first created it, we had a very, very small staff at that point. And so there was still some pushback, but not much. Um, and what I would say is, in general, um, the hardest issue I find is the getting people to buy into using the system and training and retraining the system. And I see somebody already popped up uh, in the chat, the, the same thing about, you know, people buying into saving things online when there's maybe an extra step involved or, or things like that. And I think that that's our ongoing challenge. Our most recent version of SharePoint that we just built out and implemented uh, about a month after we started working remotely uh, during COVID, which is definitely the best time to, <laughs> to implement a new system. But it had been coming for so long, people knew it was coming. Uh, the latest version that we have, we did away with folder structures almost entirely, and we're using a lot more metadata. Um, and people are loving that aspect of being able to find their documents a lot more easily. Um, and it's getting rid of duplicate documents, but people are still having a little bit of trouble buying into the extra time it takes to add that metadata. So um, in any case, that's what I would say. Yeah, I think that uh, there are hints of even what I would say in both of those answers, because I really do think the hard part is shifting perspectives on sort of what the job is of document management. And I think this is um, particularly true for um, from for, uh, let's say, lawyers, seasoned advocates, social workers, people who have been like know how they're helping people, right, and how to deliver these this helpful service to the people that you serve. Um, it's very hard to say to those folks, um, you know, uh, part of your job now is to do this kind of boring thing that's not the way you're used to doing it, but you need to do it because we are all doing it this way and this is what's going to create this kind of continuity. And this relates to the point about getting everyone to sort of like do what you want and put the things into shared drives instead of on their desktop. Use the right naming conventions, um, ha use the same system, and don't use like Word docs, Google docs, and PDFs. Like get a sense of what everyone's sort of supposed to be doing, etc. And then management buy-in is also a big challenge for a similar reason, right? Because those are also generally going to be seasoned advocates who know how to do their work. And it's very challenging to get people to shift to there is an aspect of your work that you can get better at that we can get better at as a team. And changing that perspective is really the hardest challenge. And maybe this is moving into the next yeah, go component ahead. <laughs> of our discussion, but, you know, when, when we can't find documents in a system or when it essentially becomes an access to justice issue because we're wasting time looking for things that we need 
and we can't find them. So that wastes the time. That's time that's not spent delivering services to clients. So it, it can really, you know, there are so many reasons that having a system in place, whatever the system is that you're going to use, having a system in place has so much um, value. Um, and I, Stephen, I was noticing in the chat, people were sharing um, a lot of different types of challenges. And I would say everything that everybody has mentioned in the chat was also a challenge um, for us as well. Um, you know, as I've said over and over again in internally at our organization, when, you, when you're sort of making changes of any kind or asking people to structure subfolders in a certain way, you know, there's a, a, a long process that has to go into that discussion. I think that it'd be great for us now to talk a little bit more about how we build buy-in using different narratives. Uh, you talked about the access to justice narrative. I'll briefly hint at the, uh, what I call sort of like the ethical responsibility narrative. And then I'd love, Sally, hear your perspective on those narratives too. But so for me, the one I used earlier today in a meeting <laughs> with a new client who's doing a document management project, uh, the, what I call the ethical responsibility narrative that really works on people like counselors, social workers, lawyers, um, you know, you have an ethical duty to your client and to all of your future clients to be t keeping track of the file that is like not your property. It is your client's property. You are a steward of that property. And if you treat that file in a disrespectful way by keeping it in 10 different places and never being able to find all 10 of those things, if you did that with a paper file, you would obviously, for let's say all of your files, if you did it that way, you'd be exposing yourself to disciplinary charges. So we're very lucky that the disciplinary boards aren't checking this kind of stuff the way they check for paper files, but like one day they will. And we have an ethical responsibility to maintain files in a way that we can find what we're looking for later on. Um, and and that that's a very harsh narrative, but you couple it with these sort of access to justice narratives of like, you know, we serve a population and they don't have access to these court systems. We are the way that they maintain their access, right? Uh, we need to be good stewards of that of that role. Sally, I don't know if you have perspectives on buy-in narratives, the conversations you can have with your staff um, to create buy-in for doc management. Um, well, I mean, I think that the most important thing about buy-in for my staff has been to have them see the ways that that can help them collaborate with others. Um, while we have a relatively small staff, there's just 10 of us right now, at any given moment, we have um, usually like four to, I think right now we have 10 interns working with us and making sure that they have access and ability to collaborate with the attorneys, especially when working remotely has been really critical. And so I think that working remotely has really helped with buy-in to, um, to using document man management systems and um, really collaborating in that way. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I haven't had a huge, a, a, what I'll say is I haven't had a terrible time with buy-in, um, especially, well, I would say especially from attorneys, but that's, that's not true. We haven't had a terribly hard time with buy-in from anybody. The part that becomes difficult is making sure that the ease of use is there so that people are um, inclined to use the system. So I saw somebody in the chat ask uh, a question about whether or not people allow the sync um, to their desktop for SharePoint. And um, I'll say I strongly advise against it because the sync tool is imperfect. And next thing you know, you start getting really bad issues of multiple documents um, existing or the most recent version not being uploaded. And it's those kinds of little technical problems that can cause people to just melt down and like want to disinvest completely from an online document management system. And so at this point, we've moved very strongly to you've got to access it through the web browser and for the one or two holdouts who are like i need to be able to access my documents through windows explorer we map the drive instead of syncing so they're not it looks like they're they've got it on their desktop but they really don't and um so i don't know that's my my two cents yeah joanne did you have anything else on sort of just that, you know, all change needs um, champions. And somebody made this point to me 
a while back that any kind of change you're making within an organization, especially, but especially changes around technology, you're asking your organization to make a culture shift. And that is not something to be ignored in the process. You know, the actual culture of your organization, how, what, what the knowledge base is and how you help people make that transition is very, very important. So I think that that's something to really pay attention to in terms of when we talk about what this idea of buy-in is. I also think that um, change needs champions. And, you know, our, I would say our, one of our success stories in our organization um, around technology really ac was accomplished because we had somebody, you know, our chief finance officer who also handles our operations, really championed some of the technology tools and really helped shepherd the process. And I think we were so fortunate uh, for her leadership because she, uh, she understood she had a vision for how much the technology could help, and she really understood how it would also save money. Uh, so, so you know, I think like having somebody with that kind of vision is very helpful um, to sort of moving the organization forward. Yeah, I, I think I'd I'd love to talk for a few moments about the other ways you build buy-in with that sort of vision and people who really understand what needs to be done using things like uh, creating teams and owners of different pieces of a project like this and especially around testing right so from my perspective when i do these kinds of document management projects you always want to test and you always want to pilot but the great way to be thinking about this is the minute you create something that's your first test, even if it's just you testing it, right? But then once you start thinking about, okay, every time somebody's using each new version of this is a test, you start to see how useless it is to have only you doing testing. And so pretty quickly, it's very useful to get other people on the team, build, let's say, an internal doc management transition team or whatever it might be, and bring those folks in and have them start using the thing. And you will find by like meeting two or three, someone's going to say out loud, I haven't used it because it seems too too hard or when I got in it didn't do what I expected immediately so I stopped using it and that's the kind of stuff the feedback you wouldn't get until sort of later round testing if you don't involve actual users not, not management right actual sort of line users uh, coming in who pe the people who do this line work to start using the system early and giving you feedback about how it should be structured um, those little technical details that Sally was talking about before yeah and I was just going to add that we um we also like pulled in people from different parts of the program to sort of, so we, one of our goals um, was building out practice area libraries, right? And so we pulled in practice area experts from those, you know, our, our organization's about 160 people. And so we pulled in practice area leaders who could then lead the development of those libraries and all the steps that went along, and then would be a resource for editing and updating the libraries and teaching other people how to use them. Um, and that that component was also very successful because then people um, become sort of emissaries for the project. And then the other piece is identifying people within your organization who just have great tech skills. And maybe that's not their job, but then they can help as part of the training and explanation process. Um, so those people have been a great resource as well. Yeah, I'll just add in that... Um when we did our transition it, to the newer version of SharePoint, not even the original one, but the newer updated one, um, we incorporated it into like a, a quick feedback session about it and troubleshooting session about it into every staff meeting for probably two months afterwards, maybe longer, where um, it was whether it was doing a quick five or 10 minutes on, um, you know, hey, remember, this is how you do this aspect of this thing, or, you know, just even setting aside a little bit of time to tr do some tech troubleshooting. Um, and I do think that, like, prioritizing, putting, having your management team prioritize um, discussions around troubleshooting tech is really critical, um, whether it's your document management or your case management, especially in today's age where everybody's like, not everybody's working remotely, but many of us continue to primarily work remotely. 
having that technology working is really, really critical. And people are so overwhelmed that they're not necessarily coming forward and um, telling you when there's problems every single time there's a problem. So I think creating that open dialogue where people can openly say, um, this is a mess. I hate this thing. And then you can say, oh, that's interesting. Let's troubleshoot that. And then they'll come away from it saying, oh, well, maybe I don't hate it so much is really helpful. Yeah, I think that's a, a key piece of culture change is if you train your staff and the people in your office that when they say this doesn't work for me and your answer is that's how it's done or that's what management wants or that's what we paid for and we built so that's how it works. Um, then people are going to invent their own systems immediately. They're just going to leave whatever you've built. And another challenge is if people come to you and say, I don't like how this works, and you say to them, feel free to come back with better ideas, the most exp like expeditious, the most excited super users are not going to come back. They're going to find something better, and they're just going to like get three or four of their closest friends using it, right? And so you need to create those feedback loops where people trust that they're getting listened to and that that's turning into something. Even if it's small, small somethings, uh, if people don't feel like it's turning into something, they're just going to start doing stuff on their own, and you end up with what Joanne mentioned before, which is just stuff is everywhere, you know, and <laughs> everybody has their own system. Well, and I'll add too to that, like in terms of the feedback loops, you know, incorporating tech discussions into the individualized supervision, like, you know, a quick poke into the files, are things looking the way they should? Um, is this working for you is also really helpful. Um, and then I am a huge proponent for having um, the nicest person in your office get trained up to answer some basic tech questions. And even if they can't answer them all, they can then feed it through to the people who might be able to answer it. Um, I know that's ridiculous, but so many people you hear in different agencies, different organizations talk about not wanting to contact the tech person because they feel like they're going to get blowback or it's a, they'll be told it's a Maybe they're probably not ever told it's a stupid question, but they'll feel like it was a stupid question. And so making it so that more than one person is in charge of tech and that the nicest person in the office or the most approachable person in the office can help be a conduit really does help. Stephen, yeah, I just wanted yeah, to please. add, you know, we are sort of focused on the technology component of this, but having a good document management system is really not about the technology. It, it is just about an approach and a system. So many people are keeping client files on servers, right? So we have an S drive. Um, and so we just created some basic rules. Like if you are, you know, if you have folders and this is your system, you need to have open cases and closed cases. And for every open case, you need to have a case open with the client's name on it. And, you know, like this is just a system or an approach put in place for the organization to be able, that everybody can have a shared approach. And somebody, um, I think it was Sarah who put in the chat, one of the challenges is getting everybody to name things in the same way. That can be part of your document management sort of rules or rubric, right? You know, you know, every time I open a case, I will open it as Smith Mary. And then I will make sure that, you know, files are saved by date and then by certain rules. Um, this was something, you know, the naming conventions are something that when you migrate or if you migrate to SharePoint, those are conversations that need to happen. But you don't have to wait for a migration to have those conversations and, when, you know, as part of this process, we put some of these additional rules in place because we realized, well, people are just not even keeping files that way in some cases. So you can have these conversations minus the technology. You can have it just using your S drive. Right. And then in, in the SharePoint world, and I'm not like the, the model of this, but I know like... So the, you know, Sarah's comment was around versioning and naming of versions. Well, you also, you know, in, in some of these cloud-based systems, you have versioning built in. So, you know, if you needed to go back to an earlier version or look at an earlier version, you can do so through the versioning rather than having to worry whether or not they saved the right version. And then even for the setting up of folders, some of that can be automated. Um, and so to a certain extent, you know, as you build out your systems, you can solve some of these problems by having some automation built into it. Like I know for us, for our clients, um, that Joanne and I are interesting. We discovered this in the, the, um, 
the like prep session that we have um, some similar systems and then other things that we do quite differently. And, um, and I think that that's like a really good representative of um, how things are done. Like every agency has their own way of dealing with document management because of the internal culture of their organization, the size of their organization, the breadth of programming that they have, all of that affects how you choose to organize knowledge within your your agency and for example we got rid of open files and closed files in uh, our most recent version because we found that it was just one more administrative step to remember to move something from open to or from the open files to the closed files and the open ones were getting bigger and it was just getting unruly and now we're all queued up with a new um, naming system to be able to link to to a legal server which i think people will really like because it just makes it easier you know so I, I'm always, I always have in mind the idea of how do we make things easier? How do we automate things to remove error, you know? I think that a lot of this involves making things less complex, removing things from your structure, not adding things, right? So, you know, uh, removing people's ability to use Google Drive, right? So that you'll start getting people only using OneDrive or whatever it might be, right? It's all about removing and directing. But I do want to echo back on something, Sally, that you said that I think is really important to spend a little more time unpacking and talking about. So you mentioned having uh, tech feedback during one-on-one -on -one supervision sessions. So especially within legal services organizations, there's definitely a conception that supervisor's job is on substantive stuff, right? It's to hash out what issues you're going to argue or like what resources are available for your client. Uh, and even some of the other things like let's say communication skills or whatever it might be, right, are maybe not included in the training for supervisors on something that needs to be uh, supervised. As it turns out, use of technology is one of those things because it falls under like collaborating with the rest of your office, you know, uh, and that's something you know you have probably in your like performance reviews, collaborates well with each, with the rest of the office, etc. So, things like following the naming conventions, because Joanne is exactly right. The, the first step is to make those decisions about like, what is the shared structure? What's going to work for everybody? And Sally's exactly right that you iterate on that and make it better based off of what's going to be easier for everybody. But those things are only setting the stage for, right, when you actually have to get people in there and make sure they are doing what they've sort of promised they're going to do. Uh, and that involves auditing the usage, but it also involves really direct supervision, you know, that, that I've seen some organizations not tackle at all and other organizations tackle really well uh, of, you know, just sitting down with your supervisee and saying, I looked at your shared drive <laughs> and your files are kind of everywhere. So by this time next week, I'd like you to come back to me with like a plan on how you're going to approach this because this is something we all have to be doing. And that seems very like nitty gritty and like not very interesting as a supervisor, but it is really core uh, to, to making these kinds of systems work long term. So I don't know if either of you have anything to add on sort of supervision and, and monitoring and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, as, you know, as hard as this time period of, of COVID and working remotely has been, and it has been very hard. I have a, have a team of 20 people and we haven't all been able to be in a room together or meet with each other in eight months. It's just really difficult. But one of the things we implemented during this time was a weekly check-in call, which was not something we were doing before. We were doing monthly staff meetings because we just informally communicated with each other all the time. So we put in place these weekly check-in calls across the entire organization. And they've really yielded some terrific results, including people raising technology challenges that they were having and other people being able to support them. So someone will share, I have, you know, I'm having this issue with SharePoint. Somebody else would said, okay, here's how I solved that problem. Here was the workaround. And um, it's, and, and these, look, we've had a lot of conversations. We've talked a lot about a lot of different subjects, but that is one of the things that's sort of gotten built in. And some offices are even doing sort of every other week or monthly tech talks where people can just, you know, we've got a meeting. If you have a technology question, drop in, we'll try to solve it. Um, and if we don't know the answer, then, you know, we will ask one of the experts in our organization. And we have a couple of people, our, um, our IT person and one of our HR people are just 
really great with the technology. But yeah, so we are trying to do some of our own problem solving and supporting each other in that way. I think that the role of creating peer groups where people are willing to help each other is, is really important. And I think that's really, really hard to do when people are used to working like their individual caseload or when the supervision structure or the collaboration structure doesn't create those interactions. That's even further uh, exacerbated by people working from their own homes. And they're not just like sitting at the lunch table saying like, you know, cause someone will idly muse during a meeting, like, well, I wanted to do X, but like I couldn't get SharePoint to do what I wanted. Somebody else will say, oh, I'll check with you after this meeting to help you, right? But that really requires creating a culture where people collaborate with each other. Um, any, any program or even caseload siloing right, that you sort of have people work within their own, like just get your cases done, or even just, just think about your unit or whatever, reduces your opportunities to create those conversations. And so to create more interconnection between different pieces of an office leads to much more opportunities for that uh, sort of serendipitous, uh, you know, discovery of different technology solutions and technology problems that become solutions when those conversations happen. I think it, we should talk a little bit about, you know, uh, we're going to be talking about document cleanup, right? And so I think it's going to make sense to talk just a little bit about uh, what people can be thinking about now that's going to make cleanup easier if they, in fact, do get on the train to one of these document management systems, you know, what kind of things they can start thinking about now, what kind of policies maybe they can write, uh, any perspectives on prepping people for, for what it's going to take to do doc cleanup before you transition into one of these systems. Well, when we moved over, um, we were looking at how do we tra how do we transition all this data and make it all accessible. And then finally, I think it was our um, consultant through Just Tech who was like, "Do you really need all that?" And I was, I was like, "I guess not," you know. And what's so nice is that we left the old site there, read only. And so, if anybody were to need those documents, they can dig in and peruse through this archive of old documents, but we only migrated over documents that people actively said they wanted, that they're actively using. And um, it just made a much leaner site. And um, I think, you know, for right now, much easier to access. So for us, I, I was spending, I mean, honestly, the document cleanup part is probably the most intimidating part of everything. Um, we had this SharePoint migration, and it was a migration from one SharePoint site to another, but we had this planned for 10 months before I finally did it because I kept on trying to do cleanup and felt so overwhelmed and couldn't get to it. And we don't have a big tech team. So it often is, is just me at the end of the day that's doing the final cleanup. And when we made that decision to really limit the active documents that we were going to migrate over, it just made life so much easier. We were like, okay, let's do it. <laughs> you know? So that's my suggestion. Figure out what you actually need, not every doc and then make the other ones read only. And just to add, regardless of what, you know, program or structure you're going to use on the other end, there's value to getting things under control. Now we had, you know, I'll just say our shared drive was a certain amount of controlled anarchy. I mean, it really, you know, we, we had practice area folders, but in some cases, because things had evolved over the years, we might have four or five different practice area folders for one practice area. So, you know, my old colleague, Rebecca Whittem called that bespoke, right? <laughs> like a very bespoke system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good word. I mean, even my own office, like I, when I started to do the cleanup, I realized that there were people's folder and I had been at the organization at that point, six years. And I said, oh, I don't even know who this person is. You know, there were folders in there. So, you know, what, what happens is you create and you create and you work and we're focused, we're all rightfully very focused on the work, but there has to be a component of cleanup uh, uh, in the digital world, whatever system we're using. And it was a very good lesson for me that I need to be, you know, I'm, if I am in this program or I'm in that program, I need to be periodically editing and getting rid of things. So when I update, so I'm uh, I, the practice area manager for domestic violence. So I wear a couple of hats. And so when I add to the practice area library now that we built out on SharePoint for DV, 
if I'm adding something that's replacing something else that's there, I'm immediately deleting the old thing, uh, unless it's something that's really valuable to people. I just, I've, I've learned my lesson. We have to curate uh, pretty much constantly. So even if you're not working on a major project right now, a few steps that you can take are come up with a best practices plan that culturally works for your organization and, and get people to help start the cleanup process. For the domestic violence unit, there were five people across the org who helped me clean up documents and look at documents and say, toss this, keep this, archive that. So, um, so that's something everybody can do now. Yeah, so I 100% would echo everything that Joanne just said, and I think that it just makes sense to write down your policies and best practices about how you want this stuff to work, because then that cascades out into, okay, let's recruit some people to help, let's make it part of supervision, whatever it might be, right? But the first thing you really need to think about is like, you know, who's who's in charge here? <laughs> so for instance, you know, if... um. Uh, in some of like uh, the practice library stuff that I kind of uh, didn't, you know, we make varying amounts of progress on every project we work on and even just getting people to think about it is a success in some projects. And so in the past, I've worked on like practice libraries um, with some of the practices that I've worked with uh, for individual, let's say, practices within an office. And the first conversations were always who's going to have edit access to this and whoever has edit access, how are you going to make sure they understand that their job is to just constantly just like once a week, look at it and delete some stuff that seems like it's broken links or doesn't work or is out of date, archive stuff, create processes to archive things. Right. And in the instance of case materials, especially, you're going to have retention policies. And so you just need to make sure that whatever systems you're designing to sort of think about this stuff match with whatever sort of archiving policies you have to have for those purposes. I mean, the fact of the matter is it really comes down to systematizing. It's annoying to think about. But in the end, all of this comes down to figuring out some basic rules that are built up into a system. And those rules include things like we only keep case related stuff for 10 years, and then it gets put into this archive. Uh, you know, our practice libraries get refreshed once a quarter, and the person in charge of that is the head of that practice area, right? Just like getting that those kind of basics down, uh, so that they're part of a system of some kind, uh, that'll be harder in some offices that are maybe smaller or not as systematized in general. Uh, but that is really the step is changing the culture around people fearing that systematization, that it's going to limit them, right, or that it's going to make their jobs boring or whatever it might be. Um, you have to change the culture around systematizing before you can actually create systems. <laughs> it's like an annoying fundamental truth. <laughs> to really everything I think you're going to hear at this conference, unfortunately. Um, We'll talk a little bit more, uh, but I, I want to now say that we're about 10 minutes before the end of our time together for to, to discuss the non-technical aspects of document management. Please put any sort of thoughts, musings, questions into the chat, and we will respond to those as much as we can. Uh, you know, it's, it'd be great to sort of create some more conversation around the problems people are actually having uh, in, their, in their offices. So please put those into the chat uh, as we sort of continue our conversation. Yeah, I'm interested to hear not just like the problems they're having, but why people chose to come to a document management session. So like if there's anything that people were hoping to get out of this session that they haven't heard yet, if they can pop that in or, or speak up. I think it's one of those things that it's hard to conceptualize about what questions you would want to ask just because it's such a, an amorphous kind of specific to each organization. But this question from, from David Kim, is there a best practices guide out there that we might recommend? Yeah, everybody's immediately shaking their heads no. This is, uh, uh, it depends on which aspect you're talking about, right? Because there, there are for some aspects, but as far as like structure and naming conventions and all that stuff, that's going to be very specialized. But yeah, Joanne, it sounds like you have some thoughts on this. I mean, it depends on what, what platform you're working in. Um, you know, I think that there, you know, we sort of created some basic rules around this, um, regardless of what platform we were in. And I think some of it is really focusing on what works for your organization. Um, I, I personally was advocating, for example, that, um, you know, and if you have, if you're working in the shared drive and you have 
open cases and you have your client's name, Mary Smith, but if it's a housing case, you should have one folder for correspondence and one folder for your investigation, you know, that you, one folder for pleadings. Like these are some of the systems that people used. Um, but in the process of sort of laying that out, people were like, oh yes, open cases, closed cases, client names, but now we're, we can't make people do subfolders at this time. So as you, you know, what, while what I might think is a best practice might not be what somebody else thinks is a best practice. And it might vary from practice area to practice area, depending on what practice areas your organization has. So sometimes it's, it's better to let the, that piece of it like evolve at the practice area level. I want to also echo, uh, that's a great question, and those kinds of, can you suggest specific resources uh, or specific ideas for this? I think the Ask the, Ask the Expert session that's happening a week from today uh, is going to be a great place to get uh, what might be more detailed information about that. Um, but I, I want to also answer this other question, or at least talk about this other question. Uh, we are transitioning to an e-filing system that is new to many of us for housing court. Any suggestions for managing that transition? We're moving to this system and worked in that other system, right? Uh, those are systems that New York providers are, are familiar with, right? I think the sort of immediate solution that the courts came up, yeah, I think everybody has differing familiarity with it, but the question of, um, you know, once you transition to e-filing, what are the kinds of practical considerations should you have for your own document management system is a really good question. The basic sort of first instinct answer I can give on that is, you know, you're going to be generating a lot of digital documents and you just need to be thinking about where they're all going to go. The pipeline from scanning to sort of getting into the, the e-filing system to its eventual home in your doc management system. It's just going to make your job of like thinking about that pipeline and systematizing your document management maybe an even bigger priority. But Sally, it looks like you might have some Yeah, thoughts. I mean, yeah. so the hard part with any kind of whether it's EDDS or NICEF or whatever it is, when you go to upload the documents, you can't upload them from an online location like SharePoint easily. So um, this is one of the instances in which somebody's going to need to have um, a copy of it either on their desktop or um, this is one of the few. I, I actually do sync OneDrive to my computer because for whatever reason, even though OneDrive and SharePoint use the same, same sync tool, it seems to work with OneDrive and it doesn't seem to work with SharePoint. I don't know why. Um, so, you know, I, I think that that's just, it's a really good point that you should probably create a, a, a guidance a system for how people should be safe, like where and how people should be saving documents that are going to be uploaded. And then a system for transitioning those over to your SharePoint drive or transitioning them to legal server um, and then removing them from the personal file. Um, so you're not ending up with like multiple versions of documents and you're like, which one did we submit? Which one was the final version? So, I mean, I think that in terms of like that discussion around NICEF and, and document management, that's the biggest concern, um, biggest factor I would think about. The most concrete advice I can offer on that is just do a diagram uh, of this very basic play-by-play -play of what goes into like writing, let's say, a brief, right? So, you know, diagram, how do you start writing a brief? Uh, you know, some people are going to start it on their desktop. Some people are going to start it in OneDrive in the like SharePoint version of Microsoft Word. Everybody's going to start it in different ways. So what you have to figure out is if there's a standard way that people do that. And if there isn't, do you need to mandate one or whatever, right? And then think about uh, what is the pipeline from creating the brief all the way through to like getting it into its final home. It's going to be specific to your organization and it might take some doing to figure out how the five or six different ways people are doing it can be simplified into one piece of direction that you can give people no matter which pipeline they're actually using. Yeah. We had a question in the chat. I'm curious if anyone here uses or has used Boxed, Ignite, iManagement, et cetera. Uh, people should connect on the specific tools that they're using. And I think that acts the expert session would be very useful for that. All I can say about that is I've, I've worked with organizations that do use Box. And the fact of the matter is that if you sort of set systems and set rules, you know, um, you can really use any system for this as long as you really work with your users and figure out what their needs are. Um, but people should connect with each other, uh, you know, uh, maybe even using that Twitter hashtag or using the Padlet, go to Padlet and put in, you know, let's brainstorm how you can use different doc management tools or whatever. 
the, another question on that would be, uh, does uh, having all documents saved digitally affect organizational printing costs? I'd love to hear from our organizational folks on this. Yeah, go ahead, Joanne. So I'm on a, I'm on a mission to try to get people to go as paperless as possible. You know, lawyers love paper. It, it's amazing. Um, but uh, so we have a couple of different pilots going to try to reduce paper. And we have some tremendous technology tools at our disposal. But it's been hard to get pay people away from uh, the paper when they have court-based cases. And I, I, I'm not sure, you know, it certainly saves money to go digital because in theory, there's a lot less you, you should need to print. But again, that also depends on, you know, I mean, uh, one of my attorneys who does the DAP work, the social security work, you know, as you know, social security generates, if you've ever seen anybody who's doing an SSI case, the cases are, you know, the, it's like this she made a commitment to go paperless and so far she is doing it and look she's a special person she's one of these people who can say i can see how this the value of going paperless will work for me but i think it's not something that's culturally easy for everybody to do but i mean just her doing it in our office saves it saves on printing costs it saves on paper and because we have to retain files for seven years after they're closed, it saves on all of the labor that goes into packing up those files and uh, managing those files and the costs of storing those files. So yeah, I would say, I would, uh, oh, sorry, oh, go ahead. I was just going to quickly say organizations that have maybe to newly think about or rethink about their paper storage, right? You know, thinking now like, a lot of organizations I've worked with are like, well, we've been doing it this way for so long, but we've just hit the limit of like this one filing cabinet or this one room or this one account we have. So this is a great time to be thinking about like, you don't need to keep creating that volume of paper. So that's very related, um, you know, that, that now is the time people are thinking about how do we cut costs on all this physical storage. This is certainly uh, not an easy way, <laughs> but a, a, a multi-benefit kind of way of doing it. Yeah, Sally, sorry. Sure. What I would say is that, um, so again, working remotely has catapulted us into keeping everything digitally instead of um, some people who still like to keep primarily hard copies. Um, and what I would say is that that ends up being, for me, like managing that has been more of a case management issue, case management system issue than a, like a SharePoint document management. Now they're all document management, right? And this is one of the points of confusion that happens is like, when is it legal server versus when is it SharePoint? And how do you decide which thing, uh, where you want to put documents? But um, I know that for my staff, one of the things that was a little bit difficult about the transition to the purely digital files is, you know, maybe they have like a print version of their intake form that they like to have and it looks just that way and or they have a print version of how they organize things and they really like to have that. And so we've been spending more and more time over the last couple of months recreating that appearance in print views on legal server rather than like it, if that's the barrier to going digital, like there are ways around it that are more based out of like legal server than SharePoint. Um, but I'd, I'd, I don't know if I could say it like our organization is safe. Well, we've saved a lot of money on not copying since nobody's been in the office. It's kind of remarkable. But, um, but if without that, I don't know if we would have seen that, Keisha. I'm really, I think every office should revisit what they already have in place as far as process goes, because there are places where you can leverage existing processes. So, and this is something that I saw at at my lab, at the Bronx Defenders and also at uh, the, the state PD and a bunch of other places I've looked, but there's usually some place where somebody's doing some scanning or whatever it might be, right? There's just somewhere in the process where something ends up in like a pile to get scanned, right? And so that you should think about where that is and what's included in that because then if you sort of slightly alter a process, maybe that intake sheet can also be scanned at that point and you can still, you know, it's great to try to get all of your forms from paper into something that's not paper, but also not now, but in general, when you're in court, for instance, uh, there's not much of a substitute for just like a stack of 15 pieces of paper that you can just fill in, switch, fill in, switch, fill in, switch without buying 30 tablets for people who are standing in like a crowded court building or whatever, right? So 
if that is the way, then that's the time to think about, okay, so then how are we scanning stuff now and where are they going? And could we point those scanned copies at something different instead of this drive or this whatever? Can we think about how they end up in a slightly different place to match better with the system that, that we're trying to establish here? We have come up against our time limit, actually. It's 3.51. We're a minute over. So uh, uh, thank you all for joining us. Any sort of final thoughts from our, our two panelists? Maybe 30 seconds each just to wrap up. <laughs> Joanne, uh, anything? Oh, yeah, there you go. I guess I would say is, you know, any kind of migration process or any, any process of change really does take a lot of discussion and probably will take much, much, much more time than you expect it to. And it should because it's, it should be a thoughtful process. So I guess I just want to, that's my lessons learned from, from all the technology and document management on my end. Um, and I'll just say, um, you know, if you have any follow up questions, feel free to reach out to me. I know Joanne said the same thing in the chat. I'm happy to chat with people and share kind of insight and in what's worked. And, um, and I think like one of the important things to always think about in the world of tech is looking at what's being done in other industries. So, you know, here we've been talking about um, legal aid and we have this like very traditional, you know, we have many very traditional ways as lawyers of thinking about what is a case file, what are documents, what is a document um, library or best practices library. But, you know, when you're shopping on Amazon, which is really just a collection of data and a way to sort through it, you know, you're not clicking through folders, you know, there's a lot of ways that people are very comfortable with navigating data now. They do it every day shopping and um, looking for movies on Netflix or whatever. Um, and I think that you can help people think of new ways of interacting with data um, by associating it with other things that they do in their lives and the ways that they enjoy um, accessing information and other places in their lives. So that's my little takeaway. Yeah, fantastic. My final takeaway is the best predictor for a success of a document management migration system, etc., is the health of your organization's culture, right? So that's what you should always be thinking about is how are we communicating with each other? Do we all feel like we're on equal footing? Are people feeling like they're getting heard? If none of those things are happening, then you're not, change management is impossible. And so the health of your organization and how people are talking to each other is for sure your number one predictor of how successful your tech projects will be. Take that as you will, right? As a tech consultant, I spend a lot of time talking to people about how to improve the relationships that are going on uh, within their organization. Not all tech consultants do that, right? And, you know, uh, so... Be wary when you're starting tech projects, but that has to be part of the conversation. Um, so that's, that's my sort of parting thought. With that, I think we're going to wrap up. Joanne and Sally put their email addresses into the chat. I'm going to do the same. And then uh, feel free to just reach out if you have any questions, uh, and we'll be glad uh, to, to help in any way that we can. Make sure you go back to SCED to find the link to the next session. Make sure you go to Padlet to contribute to the conversation we're having over there. And make sure you come back next week for the Ask the Expert session on doc management. Uh, and once again, thank you all so much for joining us. Just hang out until everybody's gone, I guess. <laughs>